The first five minute presenter is Ken Judd, then it'll be uh, Senior Srinivasan, then Anand and Mahdi, and Benoit Moni. Now, as many of you know, I'm a math nerd, so you might wonder what did Ken get out of this today, but no, I um, enjoyed it greatly. And uh, my undergraduate training was in math, and uh, my, the, my favorite course was logic, where learning the Goodell and completeness theorem, and what I learned from there is that if a system is self-referential, it cannot know itself, and that is what I think about societies and economics. Um, so I, I understand some of these limitations. Um, now, I want to kind of defend economics somewhat. The economic modeling, characterizations of economic modeling, I can't disagree with um, that were made today. The thing is, economists do focus on models and problems that can be solved or is tractable. Now, tractable, I think, is a dirty word, um, particularly when, um, you know, the notion of tractability is also evolving. Things that were not tractable 50 years ago are now tractable, and economists don't keep up with that. But now, good economists have always known the limitations of their simple models and simple views of the world. And I'll give an example, which um, some will surprise some people. Milton Friedman. Now, most, most of his work is guilty of all of the criticisms of homo economicus that was made here. Um, but in 1942, he was tasked with the problem, he was at Treasury, of how are we going to pay for World War II? And he formulated the arguments that, well, we need payroll tax withholding. Now, this goes against all of Milton Friedman's perfect foresight theory, consumption function, permanent income, goes against all of that. But at that time, he knew that, boy, if you want to take that much money from people, you can't wait 15 months. You do pay payroll tax withholding, and that's what we have today. So, um, no, guys like him, they, they know the, he, he, the limitations of the simple models that we have. And, um, and when actually confronted with real problems, did sensible things. Now, the, I, I understand, it's, I sympathize, I agree with m much of the criticism here, but the thing is that when it comes to real economics, when you're talking, going to communicate to policymakers, you're going to have to engage in some quantification. Um, so if you're going to talk, want to talk to the Federal Reserve about um, uh, monetary policy, um, you can't just talk about philosophy and this and that. You've got to come up with some kind of analysis. Now, um, so the it, it, incorporating evolving preferences into policy is going to require going beyond, well beyond the current analytical tools that economists have. Um, now, one thing um, Bowles said, I, I'm reading from my notes here. Bowles said we are good at math. Well, that may have been true. The economists were good at math when he, David, and I were graduate students back in the 1970s. It's not true now. Um, as one applied mathematician said, economists are so far behind um, that soon they won't be able to catch up. So I tell, I tell economists, look, okay, I'm going with them, so I'm going to talk to you until you're beyond my event horizon. They don't, economists don't like to go forward in terms of the analytical tools that they need. Um, to push this forward. Now, um, the last speaker uh, spoke of um, some ideas about how to proceed. One was idealization, or no, de-idealization, and gave that great example about gravity, um, and that and Milton Friedman talked about it. Well, that's exactly what many of us are trying to do in our work on applied math and computation. And the thing is that, okay, de-idealization is what you talk about when you talk about physics, but when you translate it to mathematics, it's called perturbation theory. So, um, and this is true for a lot of these ideas. The tools are out there. For example, Milton Friedman and, and um, the, with tax withholding, that's, um, that's related to behavioral economics concerns, people, you know, hyperbolic preferences possibly. There are now tools to look at that. And so that's the direction in which I encourage um, people in this area to think about. I'm quite happy to talk with them. Um, the fact is that uh, the profession today hates the idea 
of going beyond the math that um, we have used for, for decades. And that's a problem for me. It's also a problem for you if you want to get these ideas to be um, front and center in policy debates. Thank you. Homo economics is nothing but a model. And there's a famous saying which says, all models are wrong, some are useful. And that is a view I have taken of homo econom economics. So I teach marketing. I also do research in marketing in the business school. So the idea of a customer choosing among different products, the product which has the highest utility, that central idea in economics is exactly what we use. But we then extend it it's to say that a product is not a product, but you need to sort of break it down in terms of the different attributes of the product. So if you think of a refrigerator, it is uh, you know, the, wall, the cubic feet of the refrigerator, for example. Does it have an ice maker? Does it have stainless steel? Does it have which brand name is it? So on and so forth, for example. So if you sort of model the utility as a function of these various attributes, take a large sample of consumers, estimate the utility function for each one of these people, and then put it into a simulator and say, ask it, if the customer were to choose among these three products, which one they, would they choose in terms of total utility? And that is basically what is known as conjoint analysis, something I have done a lot of work in. And we find some 30 to 40,000 commercial applications are taking place each year all over the world. So in that sense, this simple model, which is certainly wrong as many have pointed out, is extremely useful. A second, thing, a second point I want to make is that uh, the context effect that uh, Elder talked, ab uh, talked about before is very much there. And uh, some of my colleagues, uh, Itamar Simonson, for example, have shown something called the compromise effect. So if you think of, say, a product, uh, products A, B, and C, product A is very high in price and a lot of very good features. Product C is very low in price, doesn't have that many features. And product B is in between. And what we find systematically is that the product B, the middle product, so to speak, has a much higher choice share compared to what it would ideally, what it would get based for totally only on utility itself. So somehow the middle option seems to be preferred by people compared to, compared to the extreme options. So Ron Kiewertz and uh, Wardell Netzer and I went about writing a research paper. How can we take these context effects into account in the conjoint model itself? So there are ways of doing it. Uh, you can incorporate loss aversion into it, or you can do what we call local concavity. That is, instead of an overall global concavity, which the, which the economist assumes, you assume that there is a local concavity within the region of uh, data that uh, the customers are considering different products. And that model uh, predicts much better than sort of the classic uh, overall utility model. But what we find is that when you actually try to put it in practice, this does not seem to work very well. And the reason why it doesn't work very well is that often when you have products with many, many features, it's not clear what the middle product is. So th that may be part of the reason as to why it doesn't uh, work as well. So context matters, so I don't uh, disagree with uh, what you said, and compromise effect is a good example of why context matter. Uh, but sort of to, con uh, to convert that to something to a usable model is sometimes very difficult to do. And only quarrel I have sometimes with my behavioral colleagues is that they will take the extent of saying context is the only thing that matters. I agree, context matters, but it is not the only thing that, that matters. In fact, overall preference in terms of attributes of the product also matter, and that is the reason why these conjoint models are, have been very popular. Thank you. I want to reflect on a few things that were said today. Um, my story is, you know, I didn't know that Sam had an operations research background, so do I, and so does David. So, um, so I come from applied math into economics, and after 25 years in economics, I ended up a with a process that brought me, brought me very closer, much closer to uh, Sam Bowles and to Eldar. Uh, which is, and what I've seen is not that economics is not useful, it's a very useful. A lot of it is about incentives. But what is really uh, 
we didn't talk about uh, as much is the sort of homo economicus of economists. And that's the part where uh, I had the most, the strongest disappointments over the last 15 years. And that is that we developed these mathematical models, and I disagree with Ken that we need more fancy math, uh, but we don't stop to ask uh, whether they're relevant or not. And then some of us make a leap of using those mathematical models to calibrate, to explain, without even looking out the window as they do that. And then they go on to give policy advice uh, where what ends up happening is those policy, that policy advice that a, a policymaker wants to hear will win. And the policy advice that the policymaker does not like or the industry does not like will lose. And so it's about power. And I learned that power matters. And economists don't like to talk about that, except in a very limited uh, con context of, uh, um, you know, monopoly or whatever. But, you know, as I was just talking to Benoit over here, um, and as I will be discussing uh, soon with some social, some psychologists and sociologists, um, you know, we teach in the business school um, paths to power. And path to power is very Machiavellian about uh, how to gain it, why some people have it. And uh, it, it, in a recent Economist article, uh, they observed that in this most popular course at Stanford Business School, students learn such things as to not prepare successor for themselves, take 10 titles, uh, take a few titles so they can get r be gotten rid of, and I'm only at the start of the book that I'm reading now, uh, Flatter Your Boss, Never Challenge Power, uh, on and on. And um, the economist said in an article that Xi Jinping probably didn't take this course, but emulates its lessons. So we live in a world in which the economy is dependent on people's power, uh, which they sometimes uh, use not for good, and what we therefore need is, uh, and what happened to our fancy market models and uh, um, and models that we write, is that they forgot about democracy, they forgot about justice, the way Sam had it. Thank you. So I'm a social psychologist, um, which may color what you hear next, but I was trained uh, at uh, Princeton, with, you know, uh, Eldar was one of my uh, mentors and Danny Kahneman. Uh, so I got exposed to a lot of this. And what strikes me in what I was hearing this afternoon is that um, Uskali was making the distinction between the pragmatic and the epistemic here. Uh, and uh, I talked a lot about the explananda, which I take as explananda, sorry, which I take to be about the, uh, the epistemic. And I'm wondering if we can make a further distinction between the explananda and the predictanda. <laughs> so the, the epistemic being the, uh, the explananda and the pragmatic being the predictanda. Uh, Sinu was just talking about things, you know, models that are compelling but not usable. And, um, and um, Uskali was also talking about the aggregate versus the individual, right? Like maybe economic models are not very good at explaining what Mrs. Jones is gonna do, but they might be actually pretty good at predicting the market. Um, and so then if homo economicus is not that great for those individual explananda, um, I noticed that we're talking about evolving it. I don't think, we're, I don't think we have off the shelf a great homo psychologicus. Uh, so we can go to homo sapiens and have a discussion about what sapiens means. But the truth is psychologists don't have, a, I mean, prospect theory is a little bit more of a model, but otherwise a lot of judgment decision making has been a laundry list of anomalies uh, that we can reliably predict in these corner situations. Uh, but we haven't really, I think, uh, put our money where our mouth is, in a way, uh, by, pr by actually providing uh, um, a predictance, right? So we don't necessarily have a model that predicts necessarily better. A lot of what we do is explaining, uh, I'm from the point of view of social psychologist, right? So we do pretty well at sense making, providing compelling information for why people do, uh, explanation for why people do things that seem irrational. 
it's often pretty post hoc, but just by virtue of the DNA of our discipline, we don't produce parametrized models that actually tell you what's gonna happen, right? We can tell you that's all well, this crazy effect where you pay people more and they care less about the task, but how much we should pay them, how much more or less they're gonna care, we have no idea because that's not even part of the model. I mean, we, 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 um, you know, we, we've got Linda, the bank teller, and yeah, it's surprising that people make that mistake, uh, but we can, and we can craft solutions where we call it predicting when we think the experimental group is gonna be higher than the control group, but really we have no idea about the intercept of the slope, and we don't really care about estimating those, we just move on to the next cool uh, demonstrations in a way. I realize this is kind of a provocative take, and maybe not um, the perspective you expected to use from a, to hear from a psychologist, uh, but I do think that uh, our focus on uh, on demonstration studies and proof of existence and counterintuitive finding um, that to show that Homo economicus is not always the best uh, explainance. Uh, has come at the price of not really providing a predict tense that would be uh, better than that. And there's a healthy debate. You probably know someone like Talia Arconi wrote a compelling paper a few years back saying, hey, you know, maybe we don't need to focus so much on theories as explanation if they don't do such a good job as, as prediction. Maybe it's a time to try to do uh, both. So, um, and, and I think it relates also to the as if notion where uh, as psychologists we often want to really have this scientific realism in the realism term, I think I'm using it properly here, that we really know what's, what's working and that's where the explanation, the sense making is satisfying, but that doesn't really necessarily mean that we know how to make strong predictions outside of the craf carefully crafted experiments that, create, that we create in the lab. So I guess that's my, that's what I want to put on the table, the possibility that uh, uh, there's limits to Homo economicus as an explanance, and I, explanance, yeah, I think I got it right, and, and I think social psychologists here can poke away at that, uh, but as a predict tense, uh, if, we, if there is a, d a distinction between explanance and predict tense that is valid, I think uh, it, it's still pretty compelling in a way that sometimes, as a challenge to my psychological, psychologist colleagues in the room, we come a little bit short uh, in psychology.